Have you been wondering how to make your assessments more meaningful and better reflect student growth? Today's guest shares how assessment for learning involves students in the process and makes the experience more learner-centered. Welcome to Pass the Baton, empowering students in music education. Here, we amplify the voices of music teachers around the world who are passing the baton and creating environments where the music students are empowered. Together, we can help students transform from passive consumers to vibrant creatives. Welcome back to the Pass the Baton podcast. I'm Catherine Finch. And I'm Teresa Hoover, and we're so glad that you're joining us today. So Catherine, today's guest was someone that I had, you know, I had met and was really excited for you to meet because she was talking all about assessment. And I feel like that's something that we haven't really focused on much in this podcast. Um, Mm -hmm. So I knew it was a little bit of a different topic, but her twist on assessment for learning, I felt was really a valuable perspective. Yeah. And, and the fact that when you do assessment for learning and you get those kids involved in this, in the assessment process, they become engaged and even empowered in their learning. They know where they are. They get to choose what exercise they want to do that follows this standard that they want to work on. Mm -hmm. And then they can say some next steps for their learning. So these kids um, really know, you know, are owning the learning. Yeah. It's it's such a, such a good thing to think about. So I think everyone's going to really, really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so before we get to the interview, though, we want to remind you that uh, you can find show notes in your podcast player. Um, they're also linked below in YouTube. We'll have some some different things for you down there. Yep. And please, when you get a chance, give Pass the Baton a little love and hit the subscribe subscribe button or give us a review. Those things really help us a lot. Yeah. And as you probably already have heard, we did launch a buy me a coffee site in the last couple couple months. Um, so around the same cost as a cup of coffee, you can become a subscribing member. And with this, you'll really you'll help support Pass the Baton, some things like hosting fees, other expenses. But we also have some resources there for you. So we would love for you to check that out too. Okay, welcome back. We are here with another exciting interview. This one talking about assessment, topic we haven't had yet on the podcast, and we're really excited to be joined by Terry Little. And um, yeah, Terry, hi. Thanks for being here. Hello. Thanks for taking the time. (laughs) Thanks for inviting me. This is super fun. Yeah. So I guess, Terry, we've connected a couple times over the years, but I really enjoyed when we got to have dinner together at Midwest back in December. And, you know, I got to see you present all about assessment. So um, I guess before we jump into that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What's your background and what are you currently up to in music education? Sure, absolutely. So in 2021, I retired after 36 years in the music classroom. Um, I kept the other half of my position, which was music coordinator and teaching and learning specialist in my school district. I teach in the Elmbrook School District. We are a near west suburb of Milwaukee. We have two high schools, two middle schools, and five elementary schools. My teaching experience included, I taught K-12 everything in, in a small school, general music choir. I was the forensics coach, the softball coach. Um, I taught high school, took kids to Florida, did the marching band thing. I spent 16 years with middle school students, and I spent nine years teaching uh, in a 512 kind of a situation. So that's where I really learned a lot about how students grow as musicians. And when I become my own feeder, I got very, um, you know, very concrete about what what it is I wanted my kids to know and be able to do at different aspects of their of their playing career. Um, the last 10 years or so in my district, I was really fortunate to be an elementary band director. I taught fourth and fifth grade band. That's, we start in fourth grade in our district. And so, uh, yeah, that was just super, super fun. And so now what I'm doing is basically working with teachers. We do student centered coaching in our district. So our teachers will choose a goal that is, what do you want your students short-term goal? What do you want your students to, you know, work on or fix? And then together we strategize, um, things that will help kids reach those goals. And uh, it's it's a really cool thing. And then I do a little bit of speaking for Hal Leonard. So that's how I ended up at Midwest. 
That's awesome. So you you coach teachers in student centered practices, is that right? Exactly. It's not um, in any way evaluative of what teachers do. We work together to help uh, kids do better at whatever it is the teacher feels like that group that particular group needs to set as a goal. And, you know, coming out of COVID, we've had tons of those kind of goals because kids are kind of all over the place. We've had beginners in our instrumental music classrooms in every level, you know, beginning middle school Mm -hmm. and high school. And so really I'm there to support teachers. Another thing that I do is help with students who are, have learning challenges or on the autism spectrum or those kind of things that end up in instrumental um, rehearsal classrooms and how do we help those kids stay successful so that we can keep them involved in music as they move on in school. Wow. That's, I would think you have a really great perspective just because you have done the whole gamut, you know, so that's probably really helpful to you to kind of remember learners along the way and how they evolve, you know, in music. That's really cool. And and what I do currently, this will be when school starts in a few weeks, I'll start my fifth year as the music coordinator. And I spend two and a half days usually in classrooms all over the district. And so I see a little bit of everything. I see what everybody is dealing with. And I have so much respect and admiration for teachers because we all know that it's it's a challenging job. It's a very, very difficult job. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of similarities in learner challenges at all levels, like some of the things that you see in those elementary classrooms, you see from some of like sophomores in high school as well. So <laughs> it's an interesting job. And it's it's a super fun job. I'm very, very lucky. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's get into talking about assessment. So um, you talk about a specifically assessment for learning. So I wondered if you could start with just explaining what exactly that means. So assessment for learning is really one facet of learner-centered instruction. And so in our district, we've been working on learner-centered instruction for more than 10 years. Um, It all started like way back in like 2011. Our district was looking for teachers who were innovative in their music class or in their classrooms in any building in any subject area. And so they formed this, they called it an uncommittee. And so we got together as a group of just really strong teachers. Typically we're using kind of a lot of technology at the time. And we, we went out and we did some site visits to some charter schools. And we were looking at things that were really helping students, you know, achieve and how to, how to build student achievement. And so um, at about the same time, Hal Leonard, which is their headquarters in, is in Brookfield, Wisconsin, which is in our school district, they released Essential Elements Interactive in beta form. So the uncommittee was asking teachers to make proposals for projects for student learning. And uh, at about the same time, this came up. And so I started exploring that. And the district loved it because our kids buy their own method books. And so this was a project that I could write a proposal for that costed the, the district zero dollars. So we were able to, uh, you know, start using Essential Elements Interactive uh, for basically no money for the district. Um, what really was driving me at that time were the frustrations that I had from my students, which we are all experiencing, right? I wanted them to be more motivated. You know, I was motivated. Their parents were sometimes motivated, but they were like, oh, they forget their instrument at school or whatever. I wanted them more motivated, more engaged. I wanted parents to be more involved in their students' success because we know, especially with those young learners or those learners who have challenges, that if parents are involved and supportive, that helps students be successful. But sometimes parents need tools to help them help their kids. And that was a that was another thing that uh, really was fulfilled by implementing this learning management system. Um, so then also in Wisconsin, we have uh, something called the Institute for Personalized Learning, which is actually a nationally known CESA Institute and personalized learning uh, at that time was like, you know, sort of a buzzword. It's sort of now evolved into, it could be inquiry learning or project-based learning. Uh, Now our district is uh, formatting it by universal design for learning, but it's all basically the same thing where the student is driving the learning and teachers are going to build processes that help students do that. So Through that whole mechanism, uh, one facet of this that really I spent a lot of time thinking about was assessment for learning because I was very frequently frustrated 
when it came to report card time with my kids. Now, this didn't matter if I was teaching elementary school kids or middle school kids or high school kids. I would get to the end of the grading period and I had very little actual evidence of learning. I was carrying around a lot of knowledge about my kids up in my head, but when I put it on paper, I felt exposed. I felt like I didn't have backup if I was being questioned about this grade. That I mean, that's one facet of it. The other facet of it is sometimes my assessments weren't very, you know, they weren't really getting at what I wanted my kids to know, but it was more like, oh, that's an easy score to write down. I can do that. Um, so that's when I started spending some time talk, uh, you know, kind of zeroing in on assessment for learning. So what assessment for learning is, is really integrated into the learning process. So I'm not building out, oh, it's test time, it's test time, it's test time. We have a learning process where students are um, producing evidence of learning as they're learning. And when they have that evidence of learning, whether it's a recording or a score or whatever it is, they can see it. I can see it. They can self-assess. They can use that evidence of learning to set a goal and monitor their own progress, you know, self-progress through that. Um, and then I, as a teacher, I have concrete evidence of their learning along the way. Uh, and parents and administrators, everybody can see that not only am I, am I kids providing entertainment at a concert, but they're learning and growing and achieving, you know, as learners. So that was a lot. Did I miss any, <laughs> did I miss anything important? No, I that's, think yeah, I, I think, think that's great. Also, um, oh, go ahead. I think also the other thing that I like to talk about is that as arts teachers, we we don't like talking about assessment. We think that assessment limits creativity or it takes away from our teaching time. But when you're actually building it into the learning process and it's an active thing that kids are doing, then it it um, solves all those problems. It it does all those things. I really like that you're the the emphasis on evidence of learning. Because sometimes we just think of this grade as like, oh, well, they checked all the boxes, so they get the grade, or that you know they they did these things, they get the grade. But but you're showing learning as part of it, and I think that's so valuable because then the the student sees it's not that I just need to check boxes, but these are the things that I've learned. Um, I, yeah, I really like how that fits together. Yeah, we one of the things that we do because our students make recordings over time, and at the end of maybe at the end of the school year, or maybe it's sometimes every two years, kids can go back and they can look at their earlier work and things that um, wouldn't show up in a score like breath control and tone and intonation are very, very evident when you're looking at growth over time. And this is, I mean, particularly noticeable when you're working with kids in their first, first two or three years, mm -hmm. right? But um, I think that as students get more advanced, they also have that ability to kind of assess better about about things that are difficult to quantify, like tone and intonation and playing with musicality and expression and those kind of things, where they can be very, very evident when you have a, an audio recording or a video recording of that. Yeah, I love just the idea of, you, you said there is self-assessment too. So like, it's not being done to them or they're, but they're, they're also part of the process. And I bet you they can have insight of like, gosh, when I first started, I was so nervous and I had my confidence level. And now when I play, I don't even think about those things anymore. And I mean, I just think it's just nice to hear that the self-assessment part, because there's such an integral part of the learning process. Exactly. I think there's one more thing I want to touch on is what is not assessment for learning? Mm. And it's a lot of the things that I did early in my career. So sometimes I would give kids extra credit points just to try to get them to do something that I needed them to do, which is actually devaluing their learning, right? Um, sometimes if I would give students, like I would have them do a concert reflection and I would give them no feedback on it. I would just write down the score, check it off and get it back. So if I'm a student, that feels like I'm just jumping through a hoop. It's not connected to my learning. So assessment for learning really needs to be something that is active learner centered and is connecting to what they're actually working on or something that they're doing and not just something that's easy to quantify. Yeah, that's, that makes that's, sense. Hmm. I think so, we talk about, oh, oh ahead, sorry, I think we talk a lot about purpose in our work, right? And it sounds like when there's a strong purpose, then the kids are with you and there's, there's a reason to reflect and there's a reason to move forward and but purpose is so important in our work. 
right? I, when I work with long, young teachers, especially, I, I make sure that I let them know because they, you know, they have very clear objectives and what they want students to, to do. But if their students don't understand the why of it, they're not going to engage in it. So I said, you have to make sure that your kids know why are we doing this? How is it connected to our end goal so that they know the purpose, so they know the why? Yeah. So can you give us some specifics? Like what does it really look like in a music classroom? And this could be, you know, a band classroom or, or any anything, but like what would it actually look like for the students and for the teacher? So, f- so for instrumental music, what we have done is, first of all, if you want students to engage, you want to give them tons and tons of choice. You want to give them choice in how they're going to engage in the learning and how they can show what they know. So, for instance, for instrumental music, anywhere between fourth through eighth grade, our district has developed a progressions of learning. So learning targets by level. We have five levels of learning target that address the perform grade. So they're the things you want kids to be able to do. I can play eighth notes. I can play in three, four time. I can count in six, eight or cut time or whatever. So they have a a choice chart. And they get their level usually at the beginning of the year. And then instead of saying, okay, I'm going to assign number 36 in the book, you isolate that learning. I can perform music with eighth notes. And then students can go into their book and find a piece of music that shows that they can perform with eighth notes. It has to have eighth notes in it. And giving students that choice, not only does it engage them in the learning, but sometimes it actually, um, you know, shows higher level learning because kids have to know what the learning is before they can go out and apply it, find a piece of music. And then, uh, so students are gonna make a recording, could be audio or video, they can, uh, they're going to master it, record it, they're gonna listen and self-assess with a rubric. And we actually practice self-assessment, especially for with our young learners, we listen to recordings. Lots of times, you know, kids are very hard on themselves when they're listening to recordings. So we really try to analyze, well, how many mistakes did you hear? Was that a no mistake or was that just poor tone or were you just slightly out of tune? Which was it? Uh, Was that a rhythm mistake or did you just stop time? What's going on here? So we practice and then we use a rubric that's going to identify success. So if you had one or two mistakes with your notes, you could call that proficient. If you if you have more than two mistakes, you have to keep practicing. Same with rhythm. Sometimes there needs to be something else evident. If you're talking about breathing, how many breaths did you hear when you're listening to the recording? Or are you playing with the correct articulation? Um, so students are going to self-assess. When they, when they have assessed it as proficient, they submit it to you for feedback. It can either be... Um, written feedback or recorded feedback. There's also other things that students can do to get feedback. So it doesn't always have to be on the teacher. So we talk about uh, teacher feedback, technology feedback, self-assessment or peer assessment. So another you know, really um, important part of assessment for learning is eliciting feedback, elic- uh, having um, evidence of learning that elicits that feedback. So. And then they're going to they're gonna submit it to me, and then they're going to get feedback. So that's really how they move through, and they can move through at their own pace. So for many years, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, you know, your curriculum is mo- moving at a certain speed, and yet there are some kids that could move faster, right? And there are other kids that are always going to be a little bit behind. So does that mean that this student never has to practice to be, and can still be successful, and this student never has the ability to, to get the A or whatever? So if we're moving at our own pace, it actually helps students be, you know, they're just less nervous about it. They have more confidence in themselves as as learners and uh, everyone can succeed. Yeah, Yeah, because you're you're saying that kids are the kids are not getting from this like predetermined point A to point B. They're they're moving their their own their own progression. So so we actually uh, summatively measure success. So formatively, we look at recordings and it lists and elicits feedback. And so they're getting information about their learning as they're learning. We're getting information about their learning as they're learning. Summatively, we use that portfolio of learning that they build and see how much learning have they done within a specific time period? How many learning targets have they mastered within a specific time period? Here's our, uh, our rubric for what is an A, what is a B, what is a C, or proficient, de- uh, beginning, developing. And then, so students always know where they are. They just have to look at their portfolio and they have, you know, the opportunity to redo 
as many oh, recordings okay. as they want. So a student might be in their second year of playing and they might be on level three learning targets. They need to keep moving. Or they might be still in the second half of level one. And as long as they're still moving, they can still be successful, okay? Um, and we we also uh, say that all, all growth is celebrated. So maybe some kids are growing faster, some kids are moving faster, but look at what you've done. You might not be an A, you might be a B, you might be a C, you might be a developing, you might be a beginning, you might be proficient, but as long as you're moving and growing, that's celebrated. And when we take away that fear of failure, we really see that kids become more engaged in the learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that was something that was so frustrating when I, the, in you know a, a previous job that I had you know everyone in the fourth and fifth grade in that job had to play an instrument, and some of the students um, they had private lessons or or band was like part of their family's culture, so that you know they were right. practicing at home, and other students, um, you know, no one in the family had ever played an instrument, and you know, the parents worked quite a lot. The, the student was all often babysitting, couldn't really practice at home. So they felt like there was this constant, well, I'm never going to be as good as, but what you're saying, if they're just celebrating that progress and that growth, then everyone has something to celebrate. So I'll tell you a little story. Um, I had this, this, and this happened the year that we kind of shifted from the old way of doing things mm -hmm. to giving kids more control in their learning. And I had um, some fifth grade trumpet players. I had a fifth grade trumpet group, group and there was one little boy whose mom taught in the school and he wasn't super engaged in the learning, right? He didn't practice a lot. He was so not engaged. He forgot to bring his trumpet to school on the day of the concert for the first concert, the December concert. About January of that year, we kind of shifted the way we did things. And instead of all of the students sitting front of, in front of me during small group instruction, and I would listen to them and give them feedback, Students would come in, we'd warm up together, and then they'd spread around the room and work on whichever learning target that they're working on. And then I would sort of be buzz around and give them that rapid cycle feedback that they needed. So at this point, this student wanted to learn to play on Wisconsin. So on Wisconsin's at the end of the Essential Elements book. We live in Wisconsin, right? And so he, even though that was skipping like a whole ton of learning targets, that's what he wanted to learn to play. And so he took his Chromebook into a practice room and he just started practicing that song. And he got really good at it because we, in, uh, in our school district on Memorial Day, we march in the Memorial Day parade, our little fifth grade band with another elementary school, the two elementary schools together. And we just kind of marched through the neighborhood and they memorized the song. So he was completely successful. But what really struck me was, we had at the end of fifth grade, they do they do like a, a moving on ceremony and all the fifth graders stand up and say, what was your best memory of all of your years of elementary school? And this little boy that forgot to bring his trumpet to the concert in January stood up in June and said, marching in the Memorial Day Parade was my best memory of all of fifth grade. And I know it was because we took away that fear of failure and gave him choice and control over what it was he wanted to learn. So all of a sudden he was engaged in that learning. Yeah, that's my story. I love it. You know, I think something you might have another great perspective on is what does the management system look like for the teachers? And I'm so I'm sure you've seen different teachers handle audio and video coming at them. And again, my music brain is like, that's a lot of children. So right. what, what are some suggestions if someone's thinking about, okay, I'm on board, I want to get, you know, some more assessments going for kids? How do I manage all the right. audio and video. Right. And I, again, I work with a number of teachers. Some of my teachers are like their first and second year. Some of them are like counting, doing the whole countdown thing. Uh, <laughs> and everybody has different levels of resources and time and expectations, yep. workloads. When I, when I was doing this at my highest, I had about 212 students in two elementary schools that I was listening to recordings and giving feedback to. Um, there's a few things. First of all, it's, it's not drudgery. It's super rewarding listening to those students, especially when they're making breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. If you're having students self-assess before they submit, and our, our learning management system, which is Essential Elements Interactive, it requires students to complete the rubric before it allows them to push the submit button. Wow. And, uh, you know, sometimes they're really into it and sometimes they just type a couple words, but at least they have to go through that process. So when they do that, a lot of the recordings that are not proficient or near proficient don't get to me. 
Some still do, but not a, not a ton. And if a student is constantly submitting stuff that's not anywhere near proficient, then we have a talk about, does he really understand what it is he's supposed to be doing right now? Um, there, in a, an assessment for learning, all of the feedback doesn't have to be teacher feedback. And so um, last year, new and essential elements interactive, they have now what's a feature called sound check, which students can make a recording within the program and they get uh, feedback from the computer, similar to what we used to call, um, you know, smart music. It's something else now, but they get computer feedback that will give them some information on their learning. It can tell them if they're close to proficient and it can pr give them a score, which I can see too. So maybe sometimes like for our middle school kids, if they want to do the chromatic scale, I'm not writing feedback to them, but they have to hit a certain score in sound check that takes some of the pressure off. You need to decide how much, um, you know, feedback you're able to give to students. I would tell my kids, okay, I'm not listening to recordings every day. I would I would devote two prep periods a week, usually one at the beginning of the week and one at the end of the week. And usually that was enough for me to give students feedback because it takes about a minute to either make a, a recording or type whatever. I would listen in the, like maybe before school on Mondays and see what students had done over the weekend so that when they come to lessons, I could know what they'd been working on and give them some specific instructions. I would try to listen at the end of the week so that when they went into the weekend and were practicing over the weekend, they would have my feedback to help them uh, practice. So not all of the feedback has to come from the teacher. Self-assessment and peer assessment are also, you know, really valid forms, especially if you have students write something so that it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more concrete instead of just saying, oh yeah, I, I, I did that. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, just to, to make sure that everybody who's listening knows, can you give us a, a really brief explanation of Essential Elements Interactive? Sure. Um, but some the, And you don't have to use that particular learning management system. Mm -hmm. The things that you would want is you'd want to have a model of success for kids. So either a rubric or a checklist. In EEI, students have a recorded demonstration of all the songs recorded by a professional musician on the instrument right in the program, which is really valuable for our young learners, for our kids who who are challenged and need a lot of repetition. We find that uh, you know, some of our kids with learning challenges, if their parents are sitting with them and helping them at home, they can, that tool is really helpful mm -hmm. for them. So then you need to have um, a, a way for kids to know if they're being successful. You want to have a channel uh, so that you can give feedback easily to your students in your learning management system. You want to have um, uh, uh, resources available to kids. So anything I want students to know, I'm going to give them a resource for for them to have also when they're not with me, whether it's a written resource or a recorded resource. Essential Elements Interactive has tons and tons of resources for students and for teachers. And I can put anything in there that I want to, like I can put in counting exercises sheets or cheat sheets. I can put in permission slips, any piece of paper that I want kids to have. So you want to have a resource section and then a way for kids to build a portfolio of learning. So, uh, you know, in EEI, our kids have uh, recordings. They can actually archive their recordings from one year to the next. Like, the teachers don't want to keep them year after year after year. <laughs> students can archive them and download them. So you might want to ask your students to pick two or three of your best work from fifth grade and sixth grade and seventh grade mm -hmm. to build on, you know, a portfolio of learning over time. Mm -hmm. uh, did I miss anything? Well, and then you said it's, it has it's, sound it's, check. It, it, yeah. It's been really, yeah, oh yeah. And the sound check is new and uh, I would, I, I caution my teachers because I don't really think that teachers should rely only on technology for feedback. I think that kids, when they're learning, complex learning requires quality feedback. And frequently, when you when you see something or hear something, you're going to be able to give better feedback clearly than a computer will. But it is, is also a way to take some of that um, you know pressure off the teachers and kids are still going to get feedback as they're learning. But for us, because our kids buy the book, um, it's just it's just a great way for us to manage, you know, all of the things that we want for learner centered education or our teaching. Yeah, I love that. Um, so you've you know you've been talking about we're clearly seeing benefits to this, right? But what what were some of the the things that you really noticed that changed from, you know, the the previous way and then taking this more learner centered approach? Like what what do you see either in the moment over time or any of those things? 
Well, I talked about my, our little boy. I do think that yeah. kids are more engaged in their learning because they're having choice in their learning. And the things that we started implementing for our regular ed students, we discovered were super valuable for our kids who have learning challenges, such as being on the autism spectrum or oppositional defiant or, you know, any kind of um, processing things. Whenever you can have visuals or other um, ways to teach the learning, you know, through the different modalities, uh, that's what learner-centered education is. It's just going and meeting that student wherever they are. And, you know, to a certain uh, degree, we're, we've we always been learner-centered teachers. We haven't had a lot of choice. But, I, you know, all those years before the technology became available, I was like, I wish I, wish I could give all my students private lessons because this kid needs this and this kid needs this. And so technology has really helped us achieve some of those goals, not all the goals. It's not perfect. And st kids still have to engage in the technology. And I think we kind of have noticed that uh, like post COVID kids address technology in a different way than they did before COVID, right? They're just like, I've had enough of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, interestingly enough, when, when our district went out in March of 2020, we already had this all in place. So my kids didn't miss a beat. I actually saw most of them the day before school went out. And I'm like, okay, you guys, you have your learning targets, you have your goals, everybody knows what they need to do. You can send me a message and I'm going to give you feedback, make your recordings. And, and it actually went off without a hitch. Um, since then, and kids have become a little bit more resistant to making recordings and those kind of things. I just keep throwing the focus back on, you're already doing the learning and we are just, you know, archiving, we're, re we're recording your learning. We're making it, you know, a recording of what you've already done. And I really need you to, to self-assess. I want you to listen to what you're doing because I know that you're going to learn better when you can, when you can self-assess successfully than if I'm telling you what you're doing wrong. I think one of the, one of the best outcomes of this whole situation is when a student, so all of a sudden my students and I are on the same side. They choose the learning target, and then we're working together to help them achieve success on the goal rather than I'm not the adversarial bestower of the grade anymore. I'm working <laughs> with them, right? And so, I mean, that's really what learner-centered education is all about. Yeah. I can imagine when they pick up their instrument, practicing is like they know what to do because they've had some reflection in what what's not going well, what needs to be next, you know? So like practicing is probably super, um, I don't know what the word I'm saying, just they know what they're, they know what to do next. They, uh, they have the responsibility. So I don't do practice yeah. records anymore. Like over time I did every kind of practice record known to man, right? <laughs> But uh, I don't, I, now I say, I'm, I'm not interested really in how much you practice. That's your business. I want to know what you can do. So you have to show me. And then when they come to small group instruction, they don't say, what are we doing today? Instead, I'm going to say, all right, what are you working on? What are we doing today? So it's flipped. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, I guess that maybe leads into something else we wanted to ask, which is if our listeners are interested in trying something like this, what could they try tomorrow? What would you suggest? Oh, I have a whole list. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. I think the first thing as instrumental music teachers, particularly we should do is audit your current assessment practices. How much are you assessing that is informal, which is very valid. You're the expert and you're telling kids what they need to be able to do. Um, but it's not, you know, it's, it's not there. It's not, it's gone after a moment. How much of it is, is formal so that you have a score or an assessment or a recording and real evidence of what that learning is? Because we know that typically in music, we assess and we give feedback to kids and we, we do all those things in groups. All right, everybody go home and practice instead of that, that individual, individual specific feedback. So assess, um, audit your current assessment practices, you could review your current assessment tools. Could they be more learner centered? And do they give feedback immediately or near immediately in some way? It doesn't always have to come from the teacher. Um, explore technologies that give students feedback as they're learning. There are tons now, all the time. Sight Reading Factory, uh, musictheory.net, there's you know all the Kahoot kind of things. So there's tons and tons of ways for kids to get feedback as they're learning. So if you as the teacher set up that process and then they just share it with you, Oh my gosh, who's doing all the work? They are. 
<laughs> um, establish a portfolio of learning for students that gives evidence of growth over time. Uh, super valuable for everybody involved. Students can see their own growth. Parents can see their growth. I never get questions or phone calls at report card time ever because they can hear <laughs> what their kids have done and they can see the feedback that they've gotten. Uh, provide opportunities for students to self-assess, peer assess, and set their own goals for growth. Mm -hmm. You can do that in a million different ways. And there's lots and lots of projects. Uh, we do we do also do a composition project through Note Flight Learn. And that gives students, you know, we, we give them a, a checklist of things that their composition ha has. So we're, we're giving them clear expectations of what they want. The composition gives evidence of learning. If my, my fourth graders write with paper and pencil, so they're showing their music literacy skills in a whole different way than taking a test. And then our students can peer assess through the program and they can give each other feedback. And we teach them how to peer assess in a way that would be open to the people that they're assessing. <laughs> uh, create multiple opportunities for students to get feedback on a target or a standard during a grading period. I think lots of times my assessments in the old days were one and done, right? And that's mm -hmm. not really fair for anybody. And that doesn't promote learning or growth. We don't want one and done. We want over time, are we growing? And how do we know that? Yeah. Oh, that's good. All right. Hopefully people were taking notes, but if not, it's a podcast. <laughs> they can always rewind. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, those are such good suggestions and, and they're all very, they're all very practical and achievable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say don't, cause as I said, we've worked on this for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, just try one thing, you know, just try, you know, having students record and self-assess or, Try listening to recordings and have students practice assessing because lots of times they're like, oh, that was terrible. And really, there was only like two mistakes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you you have anything you want kids to know, you have to teach them how to do it. Right. It, yeah. it takes time. And if it's truly learner centered, that's going to take you where you need to go. Right. When you follow what your students need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So to kind of take a little a little bit of a shift. Um, so as you know, I've been working on, you know, this doctoral degree and part of my research is surrounding student empowerment. And, you know, empowerment's a word that Catherine and I have been using for several years. And I know a lot of people, you know, have been using it. And I'm, I'm just discovering that it's used in many different ways and different people have different ideas of what empowerment means. So I guess for you, when you think about student empowerment, what does that, what does that mean to you? So very, very clearly, it comes back to very basic things. So when a student comes to small group instruction, they don't say, what are we doing today? I say, what are we working on today? How can I help you? So they have control in that way. And then uh, that that idea of we're working together for you to achieve success. And I think all my students knew that. They knew that I was there to help them and it's really up to them to learn. And I, maybe the other thing would be the pa the whole pacing thing, because we're not factories, you know, we're not turning kids out uh, at the end of the year, all in the same place. And we need to, we really need to celebrate that, especially in these times, because I think that student engagement is probably our biggest challenge right now. Right. And the only way that we're going to engage some students is to empower them and give them the choice and the control. So uh, when they can move at their own pace and all, all learning is celebrated, whether you're here, 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 um, to me, that's student empowerment. Yeah. So how can people connect with you and learn more about your work? So I don't have a website. I haven't written a book. <laughs> I've done, I, I love talking to teachers uh, and I have tons of um, resources in my Google Drive. So, and I share everything because people shared with me the whole idea of a choice chart for student learning. I stole that from an English teacher, right? And that's how we get some of our best ideas is by sharing, sharing, sharing. So my email address is little, L-I-T-T-L-E with a T on the end. So little T at... Elmbrook, E L M B R O O K schools, plural, dot org. And I would never give anybody information without a visual, but here's information without a visual. <laughs> so 
little t at elmbrookschools.org. Okay. We'll make sure that we put a visual of that. <laughs> you could probably Google Elmbrook and find yeah, it that that's way. True. <laughs> Very good. Oh, this is, this is so wonderful and so many good ideas that I know I think people are going to really appreciate and resonate with. And yeah, so we, yeah. we, we appreciate your time and your willingness to share. Oh, well, thanks for letting me babble on. Of course. It's great. great. (laughs) Thank you. If you liked today's episode, you will love the PassTheBatonBook.com website, where you can find free resources, coaching services, and how to support Pass the Baton. Speaking of support, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Thanks again for listening.